I was 19 and my sister was diagnosed with ovarian cancer. And uh, a couple of years later, she passed away. And uh, it was obviously a really hard time on the family. I ended up moving away from my home church, kind of drifted away from the church a little bit. Get, I got a new job. My dad, when I grew up, had uh, a, a bunch of back pain problems, and he uh, was using prescription drugs. He uh, he, he struggled with uh, dealing with the loss of my sister and uh, ended up switching from prescription drugs to heroin. He lost his job, and um, it, like five or six years later, he ended up uh, losing his life over it. So that was another big struggle. But the, the one thing I keep thinking about is that through that whole process, I feel that God was preparing me by getting me back involved in the church community because I was kind of separated from the church and the body. And I feel that God knew that I was going to need the, the church family and him when my, when my dad passed from my Bible study group, from the worship band, just everybody. It just surrounded us with love. And I, I never felt God's presence like that moment. And God just, just flooded me with His grace and mercy. It's a church that's large like ours. You don't always know everybody, what's going on in their lives. And so you see Tim up here playing drums every week and may not know what he's been through. Not all of us know what everybody's been through. But we do know the God that we worship and who's with us in the midst of that. And uh, I know Tim, and I was there at the graveside service for his father. His dad had been coming to church in the last few months before his death. And so there was really good hope in the midst of real painful things toward the end there. But Tim's right. He felt the presence of God, God with him, by the people of God coming around him. We needed it most. Let's pray, and then we'll, um, we'll ask God to speak to us. Father God, thank you that you're with us even when we're not paying attention, even when we doubt you or are questioning you or feel far from you, and you're with us even now. So we ask you to speak to us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, before we get into the sermon, which is uh, it's really, uh, there's a lot in here. It's going to take us about an hour, but... Um, <laughs> But I want to just uh, highlight something that happened this week, which I think is really exciting and fun. So much happens throughout the week in our church that we don't always have time to talk about it. But one really cool thing, which highlights what we're trying to be about here as the people of God in this location. And that's this past week. And we talk about being a good neighbor, loving your neighbor, giving your life away for the good of others, making an impact right where you live. Whether or not that person ever comes to church, just loving and serving people because that's what God has done for us. A group of moms from Moms Connected or Moms Together, they're just their moms, I know that much. They got together and they um, packed bags, uh, little gift bags with cards and scripture and treats and giveaways and gifts to the first responders in our communities. Firefighters, paramedics, police officers in Batavia, Geneva, St. Charles, Elburn, and so on. And they deliver these to these to firehouses and police stations. And it was just a great act of love and generosity and kindness to people who serve us that we don't often thank or think of very often, especially at this time of year. One of these firefighters is, is the captain of a firehouse in St. Charles. He actually attends here, and he put this on Facebook, this little... His name's Jeff Terrell. He said, look what we found at the fire station. We got back from a call. The guys were tearing into them, and I was thinking how well done they were with simple verses, a handwritten note, and good stuff inside. Then I saw it was from my church, and he had no idea. <laughs> these guys, he comes back from a call, and he sees all these bags laid out. The guys are ripping them open and tearing in, and he goes, that's my church. And he, he told me personally what an opportunity he had to talk about Jesus because of the act of kindness and generosity. So just want to say to all you moms who did that, uh, way to go, great job. And there's opportunities all around us to love people and serve people, whether or not they ever come here, just because it's what God's called us to do. All right, now, we've been in a series called With, looking at Emmanuel, God with us. How do we experience Emmanuel, the, pro the promise of Emmanuel, that this was a prophecy that Jesus is the fulfillment of, and then the presence of Emmanuel, that he's with us personally, and last week, the power of Emmanuel. This week, I want to look at something different, the peace of Emmanuel. When I say that phrase, the peace of Emmanuel, the peace of God, peace on earth, we say at Christmas time. It doesn't, you don't have to look very hard in the world today to find lots of evidence that there's a real lack of peace. Would you agree? 
in our culture, in our political system, in our world. We hear regularly about the, North, the threat of North Korea. Their military amassing, testing the missiles, and our own president tweeting threats. We won't get into that. But there's a, just a general lack of peace. Or, or just a few months ago, we were talking about the aftermath of one of the most recent mass shootings in our country in Las Vegas. And I have a friend who's a pastor near Vegas who said that people were coming in droves to find hope after the, the mass shooting there. Or it wasn't that long ago, we talked about Charlottesville, all over the news. White supremacists marching and the violent protests between a group called Antifa and KKK members and so on. Real picture of a lack of peace there. We've heard for years now about the growing, uh, increasing worldwide global crisis of refugees, not just in Syria, but all over the Middle East. And more recently, closer to home, uglier in some ways, the ever-expanding list of men in positions of power in our culture who are accused of sexual assault. Now, I don't, I don't want to get into the politics of all of these things you just saw. What I am saying is this should grieve our hearts and it should cause us to question what's wrong with the world? Where is this peace we sing about at Christmas time? It doesn't seem to be here, does it? I mean, it seems nostalgic to sing about it and talk about it, but where is it really? Where do we experience it? The great poet and theologian Bono wrote a song, <laughs> I just like saying that, wrote a song called Peace on Earth. It's not one of his best, it didn't top the charts, but it's, he asks a question, see if you can hear the question. Jesus, could you take the time to throw a drowning man a line? Peace on earth. Tell the ones who hear no sound, whose sons are living in the ground, peace on earth. Jesus, the song you wrote, these words are sticking in my throat. Peace on earth. I hear it every Christmas time, but hope and history won't rhyme. So what's it worth, this peace on earth? He's asking a question, isn't he? Where is it, Jesus, this peace on earth? He's echoing the same question, uh, which was written in a different Christmas hymn, a lesser known one called I Heard the Bells on Christmas Day, written by the poet Henry Wadsworth Longfellow in 1863. I heard the bells on Christmas Day, their old familiar carols play. In music sweet, the tones repeat, there's peace on earth, goodwill to men. I thought how as the day had come, the belfries of all Christendom, had rolled along the unbroken song of peace on earth, goodwill to men. And in despair, I bowed my head. There is no peace on earth, I said, for hate is strong and mocks this song of peace on earth, goodwill to men. Now, the carol doesn't end there, but we'll come back to it. I want to leave you with that question. Where is it? We don't see it. We don't experience it. We long for it. We sing about it. We recite it. But do we see it? Both of those songs are expressing that same question. And it's the question that we, we should feel and sense when we read Isaiah's words you had re heard read a moment ago. Isaiah chapter 9. Some excerpts from Isaiah's great prophecy of the Messiah. Verse 2. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in the land of deep darkness, on them a light has shone. And verses 6 and 7. For unto us a child is born. To us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness. From this time forth and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. You've heard that, read at Christmas time, right? Those names of God, Isaiah's prophecy about the coming Messiah, and then he gives us these sort of sequence of names. And I was thinking, those four names would make a good series next year at Advent, but let me just go through them briefly. First he says, and by the way, when you name your son or daughter, you, you choose a family name or a name that's significant to you, or you pick it out of a list of baby names or a name that, you know, you don't want anybody else to have, you know, and then you find out like 10 years later, oh, everybody was named Noah that year. You, you, you do your thing, right? You hope that your son or daughter grows into uh, a, the character of a young man or woman that would, that would reflect well on that name. Or if the name has meaning, you hope they, they actually live up to the name. But when God tells us the name of someone, he's not saying, I hope this works out. He's saying this is true about them. This is their character. And so when he gives us the names of Messiah, Jesus, who's God himself, he's not saying, well, I hope Jesus lives up the baby in the manger grows up to be this. He's saying this is who he is. First, wonderful counselor. 
wonderful counselor. You hear the word counselor and perhaps some of you think therapist. And it's so much more than that. Jesus is not your, your, your wonderful therapist or life coach, although he can certainly offer you good advice. What does it mean, wonderful counselor? How many of you have ever in your life thought, I don't know what to do in this situation? Show of hands. If your hand's not up, you're not listening or you're lying, right? <laughs> it's just true. I don't know what decision to make. I don't know if, if, if this is the right move or not. I'm not sure about this relationship or this job or whatever it is. I don't know what the future holds. Sometimes as a pastor, people will come to me for spiritual counsel. And they'll lay out their life. And sometimes it's full of brokenness and pain. And you know what? More often than I would like to admit, I have no idea what to say to them. I, should, I probably should admit that publicly. You won't come anymore. <laughs> I don't know. I don't, I'm nobody's guru. I don't have the wisdom and the knowledge to fix whatever is broken. I can point them to the Word of God and to Christ and pray with them, and that's the best I can ever offer. But I don't know. In other words, we, both in our own life and those we, we love and serve, don't always know what to say or what to do or where to go. That is never true of Jesus. Never. He always knows exactly what you need and how you need to hear it. He's a wonderful counselor, and his counsel is always wonderful. We just don't always heed it. And he's everlasting father. I mean, he's a mighty God, excuse me, mighty God. So not only do we lack wisdom and counsel, we also sometimes lack ability, don't we? How many of you have had this experience? You know exactly what you should do, but you can't seem to get yourself to do it. Anybody? Right? Every hand should be up, right? I know what I should do. I know what the right call is here, but I, for some reason, I'm, I keep making the wrong call. I keep ignoring it. I keep putting it off. I keep doing the opposite. He's a mighty God, meaning Jesus is able to empower your spirit to say yes to his will for you. I've had people come to my office, and I know what they need. I, I've had men in my office who unpack addiction, brokenness, pain, and they're afraid that if they confess it, their life will end. And it's the one thing they need to tell the truth. I know what they need. I know what somebody needs, and I, and I say it to them. I know exactly how to apply the gospel to their life. And they get up and walk out, and I feel powerless. I can't make them do it. I can't force them to do what's necessary. And I have the sneaking suspicion they may not. But Jesus is not only a wonderful counselor who knows what you need, he's also your mighty God, meaning he can enable you to do that which you could not do on your own. He can empower your spirit, your will, to say yes to his will. And then he's an everlasting father. Simply this means God's disposition toward you is that of a loving father in Christ. Now maybe you didn't have a great earthly father. Then he is the father you all, your heart always longed for. If you wonder, how, what does God think of me? Because of Jesus, you can know that God's attitude toward you is that of a loving father. Psalm 103, verse 13. As a, as a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who trust in him. That's how he looks at you, my son, my daughter, my child. That's how he views you. Think about that for just a minute. Those three names, briefly. Your wonderful counselor, he knows what you need. Your mighty God, he can empower you to do it. And your everlasting father, I mean, he loves you like a son or a daughter. That's pretty good, isn't it? You ever watch the old Ginsu Knives commercial from the 80s? Remember that? He's cutting a shoe or a tin can, and then like he's pounding, he says, how much would you pay for a knife that does all this? And then what does he say? But wait, there's more. Some of you, if you don't know what a Ginsu knife is, Google it, you youngsters. It's a great commercial. I feel as if the, the, Isaiah is saying, he's your wonderful counselor, he's your mighty God, he's your everlasting father, and we're reveling in that. And he goes, but wait, there's more. And the last thing he says, he's your prince of peace. That's where I want to camp out this morning. He's your prince of peace. I think it encompasses all the other names. Now, it, we hear this, prince of peace, and it's hard not to think about those images a moment ago, right? The lack of peace in the world. Prince of what peace exactly, Jesus? Where is it? This is the paradox of peace. The paradox of peace. How can Jesus be the prince of peace when we see so much violence and conflict and hatred in the world today? It's a good question. 
Is it just something we say at Christmas time to make ourselves feel better? Or is it any real sense he's the Prince of Peace? Ironically, this tension was also present in Isaiah's day. When Isaiah wrote his Isaiah scroll, his prophecy down in about 700 B.C., that was at a time in Israel's history when it was called the divided kingdom. Now, if you don't know much about your Old Testament history, let me give you a crash course. Israel as a kingdom, as a nation, uh, be, had, had division because of rival kings and just be bad behavior, basically, in, their, in their, their, their nation's leadership. And they split into a northern and southern kingdom. The northern kingdom was called, kept the name Israel. The southern kingdom was called Judah. Judah's where Jerusalem was located. And Bethlehem. The northern kingdom was conquered by the Assyrian Empire. And they were threatening little Judah, little tiny kingdom. And the Egyptian Empire was coming up from the south. So you have this little kingdom threatened on, from the north by the Assyrians and the south by the Egyptians, living in a very precarious situation, starving. The national economy was in shambles. They had no real military defense to speak of, not that they could stand up to the might of the Assyrian Empire. In fact, if you read Isaiah chapter 8, you get a pretty bleak picture of the people of God. And then comes chapter 9. He's saying, there's still hope. God's not done with you yet. In other words, into this depressing, dark, uncertain, difficult situation in your nation, in your culture, in your world, I have not done. I'm going to do something. And a matter of fact, in Luke chapter 2, Verses 13 and 14, you know this story. We read it every Christmas time. The announcement to the shepherds, right? Verses 13 and 14 of Luke 2. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. These are shepherds. These are just above peasants. Nobody's from nowhere living outside of Bethlehem. And Israel at that time is an occupied nation under the thumb of Rome, heavily taxed. Uh, you've heard of the Pax Romana, the peace of Rome? It wasn't all that peaceful, actually. If you stepped out of line, there was a high price to pay. Rome kept the peace by the sword, brutally oppressing the Jews and the na nations they conquered. So in, in Isaiah's day, the Prince of Peace is coming. Well, where? We're threatened on all sides. In the day of the announcement to the shepherds, the peace will come. Yeah, we're under the thumb of Rome here. And in our day, we look around and say, where is it? My point is simply this. There has always been a tension between what we observe in the world and the promise of God's peace. So how do we understand it? How do we make sense of it? Peace on earth. We tend to think of peace, you see, as the absence of conflict. As like ceasing of wars. No strife, no struggle, no problems between people. And in fact, we talk about things like peace treaties, peace talks, peace accords, right? They never seem to work out, do they? How many times in your lifetime have you heard about Middle East peace talks? They're still going on. They will always be going on. In fact, the most famous exa example of this from history is what we call the Munich Accords, the Munich Agreement. Some of you might know this from your history class or your own life. The British Prime Minister at the time, Neville Chamberlain, met with Adolf Hitler, then Chamberlain of Germany, Chancellor of Germany, excuse me, and they met for the Munich peace talks, fighting over Czechoslovakia at the time. And Chamberlain comes back to Great Britain and announces on the radio, BBC, this famous line, we have achieved what? Peace for our time. Peace, we did it. We signed the paper, we've achieved it, we've made peace. Less than 10 months later, the entire world was at war. World War II. The war to end all wars. You can't find the kind of peace that's promised in Scripture by signing of a treaty. See, we think of peace as like, uh, uh, militarily or politically, either one side wins, like the end of World War II, right? We beat you, and therefore you will sign this, or we're wiping you out. Or it's a compromise. We think it's either conquest or compromise. Compromise meaning let's lay down our arms, let's come to some resolution, let's, let's find a middle ground here and a rel relative peace. That's not what Jesus is the prince of. In fact, you may know this, that the Hebrew word for peace in Isaiah is what? Anybody know? Shalom. It's how you say hello and goodbye in Israel today. It's a greeting. 
The word shalom, it's accurate to translate peace, but it doesn't just mean ceasing to fight. If you say shalom to a Jew in Israel today, you're not saying, hey, let's not fight. You say much more than that. You, it, it's a way of saying wholeness, harmony, completeness, perfection in your heart, in your life, in the world. To wish somebody shalom was not just to say, I hope you don't have any fights. It's to say, I wish you harmony, wholeness in your life, perfection. Jesus is the prince of shalom. The baby in the manger who grows to be the savior on the cross didn't come to negotiate a truce or some compromise. Nor did he come to forcibly subdue everybody by the sword. He came to bring shalom, peace. But where is it again? This is the personal power of peace. I love the alliteration, don't you? The personal power of peace. In the Gospel of John, Jesus says some things that we need to put together which are very intriguing and helpful to understand this. In chapter 14, verse 27, John, Jesus says these words. In John 14, 27, he says, My peace, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. What is he saying? Jesus says, I'm giving you my peace, my shalom, and it's not like anything the world can give you. Then two chapters later, in chapter 16, verse 33, he says, I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace, shalom. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I've overcome the world. Put those two phrases together, those two statements of Jesus together. What's he saying? The peace that I'm prince of is not like anything you find in the world. It's not just the absence of conflict. Because you're going to have conflict. You're going to have trouble. It's something else entirely. What is it? He's not talking about peace of mind or inner peace, some meditative calm that you achieve in the midst of chaos. I've heard Christians quote Philippians 4, 7, as if it's some sort of magic verse. Do you know this verse? And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Have you heard that verse before? Heard the phrase, the peace that passes understanding? How many of you sang that when you were in Sunday school, that little phrase, you know? What is that? Sometimes I hear Christians talk about this like it's some sort of magic bullet. Ah, oh, the peace, it just descends over me, like it just comes without warning, and I feel peaceful. You know the context of that verse? Verse 6 of chapter 4 is, submit your request to God. Pray, in other words. Verse 8 and 9 is, whatever is excellent and noble and trustworthy and praiseworthy and beautiful and pure, think about those things. That's how you find the peace. Submit your request to God, be anxious about nothing, pray, and focus your mind on the things that are beautiful and noble and worthwhile. But even that is not really what Jesus is talking about when he says, I'm the Prince of Peace. Fundamentally, the peace that Jesus came to bring is not an internal feeling or horizontal relationships. It's vertical. When Jesus says he is the Prince of Peace, he's not talking about how you feel or the world around you. He's talking about peace with God. Now, if you've not been listening to this sermon up until this point, I, 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 don't, I don't blame you. But wake up and listen now. This is the most important thing you could hear this morning. Not because I'm saying it. I believe it's what God wants you to hear. The peace we sing about at Christmas time, peace on earth, the peace that Jesus is the Prince of, shalom, is not a feeling. It's not the absence of difficulty in your life. It's making you right with God. Romans 5, verse 1. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we, let's read this together, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. What does that mean? Justified by faith. When you place your faith in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, you surrender your life to him, you have peace with God. Regardless of what's going on circumstantially. Regardless even of how you feel. It's an objective reality. Remember this, the great Christmas hymn, Hark the Herald Angels Sing? Glory to the newborn king, peace on earth, and mercy mild. What's the next line? God and sinners reconciled. That's it. That's peace. What Jesus came to bring is not make us all feel better once a year, but to put sinful people right with God. He's saying you're not right with God. 
Apart from Jesus Christ, you are not right with God. That's not popular to say. It's somewhat offensive for you to hear. But it's true. The peace that we sing about at Christmas is to put broken people, sinful people, wayward people, right with God. Justified by faith in Jesus Christ, you have peace with God. Apart from that, there's no peace. <laughs> Jesus even, or God even says in the, in the Old Testament prophet Ezekiel, the, the false teachers yell, peace, peace, when there is no peace. There's only one way to find it. There's only one way it's achieved. And by the way, this is not like you and Jesus negotiate a truce. Jesus, you do your part, and I'll do mine, and we'll sort of have peace, right? This is unconditional, complete surrender to the greater power. Lay your life down, surrender, and be found in him. Be made right with God. And you know what keeps me up at night sometimes? What keeps my wife up is my snoring, but what keeps me up <laughs> is sometimes I worry and I pray that you could come to this church for years, feel good, love the people, love the stuff we're doing, and never know this. Never in your heart know that the peace we sing about, that you read about, is available to you. That God loves you enough to reconcile you to himself, but you are not right without Christ. You say, well, I'm not at war with God. I'm just not paying that much attention. In your heart, there's only one of two places. You either surrender to him and at peace with God, or you are against him. Jesus says you're for me or you're against me. One week till Christmas. I hope this message gets through to your heart. He's the prince of peace, meaning he wants to make you right with his father by his death and his resurrection. Apart from Jesus Christ, you do not have and you cannot have peace. So for the Christian, peace is not just the absence of something. Peace is not just the absence of anxious thoughts or bad circumstances or bad feelings. Peace is the presence of someone in the midst of all that. Ephesians 2, the, Paul, Paul, the Apostle Paul says, which we're going to study Ephesians, by the way, in the new year. It's going to be awesome. But in Ephesians 2, the Apostle Paul says, he himself, Jesus, is our peace. There is no other thing that he gives us apart from himself. Now, in our culture, we tend to place peace and quiet together, don't we? How many of you dads have ever said, can we get some peace and quiet around here? Last night, my, my, my two older children are home from college, and we were all five of us together in the house for the first time in months. It was fun. It's also loud and messy already, but fun. And we're watching Hallmark Christi Christmas movies. I don't know which one it was. It doesn't matter. They're all the same. <laughs> but we were watching this movie, and we were playing this game. This it was a fun game. You can download this. It's called uh, Hallmark Christmas Movie Bingo. And you, it's got little phrases in the squares that says, uh, like, meddling best friend, uh, boss who lacks Christmas spirit, like, country town that's way into Christmas, you know, like all these stuff. And you, li you watch the movie, you fill it in. So we're laughing and yelling and screaming and having a good time. And I, I'm downstairs looking over my notes. I can hear them screaming about, like, I go up and play bingo for a while. Then I figure, hey, it's 10 o'clock. I gotta go to bed. I have to preach about peace in the morning. Could you guys keep it down? Could you give me some peace and quiet? Right? And I'm up upstairs with the fan on in the bathroom. I can hear them laughing at the Hallmark movies, right? Peace and quiet. The Bible does not put peace and quiet together. You know what it puts together with peace? Over and over and over again in the New Testament? Grace. Grace. In fact, if you go home and look up the beginning of all of Paul's letters in the New Testament, Romans, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, all of his letters, in the very first chapter, the first couple of verses, you'll find the same line repeated. Grace and peace to you through God, our Father, and Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Over and over again. It's not some fancy Christian way of saying, how you doing? He's saying something profound. The grace of Jesus Christ, unmerited favor, that God loves you enough to die in your place and forgive your sin. Grace of calling you son and daughter gives peace. It has to work in that order. There's no other way. That's why the baby came in the manger to become the man who lived the perfect life and die on the cross to bring peace. Someday, the king will return, we're told, in Revelation. 
And then he will end all wars. Then he will make every knee bow and tongue confess. But between this day and that day, he's bringing peace to your heart and mine. You cannot experience the peace of God until you have peace with God. Last, the pursuit of peace. The pursuit of peace. The Bible clearly calls those of us who belong to Jesus to pursue peace, seek it, be practicers of peace, peacemakers in the world, seeking righteousness and justice and mercy and all of those things. But only out of the place of being made right with God, having peace with God through Jesus. 1 Peter 3, verse 11. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. And Romans 12, verse 18, if possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all people. So seek peace, pursue peace, be peacemakers in your lives, and, but then this is the motivation. Let the peace of Christ dwell in you richly. But ultimately, you don't find peace. You heard people talk that way, right? I need to find some peace. I'm, I'm looking for peace. I'm seeking peace. Ultimately speaking, you don't find peace. Peace finds you. Peace is not an abstract concept. It's a person. The peace of Emmanuel. He is the prince of peace, shalom, harmony, perfection, unity in your life. He, Jesus said, I came to seek and to save that which was lost. In other words, the Christmas message is not that we go looking for peace once a year and recenter ourselves. It's that Jesus came to the world to find us, to make peace between us and God. So I want to leave you this question. Not, have you found peace this Christmas? But has he found you? Has peace found you? And have you surrendered to him? One week till we celebrate Christmas and do all the stuff we do. I challenge you this week, think about that question. Pray about that question. Do you know peace? His name is Jesus. Let's pray. Father God, we pause to confess that we live in a world that is torn with division, and brokenness, and pain. And in our own lives, we're divided, anxious, fearful. We say this every week, but if you're here and would like someone to pray with you, perhaps about finding peace with God through Christ, members of the prayer team would love to meet with you down front. And and let me leave you with this. Remember the question that the two songs by Bono from U2 asked? Could you throw a drowning man a line? He has in Jesus. And the, and the, the song, I Heard the Bells on Christmas Day, listen to how the, the, the hymn ends as your benediction. Then peal the bells more loud and deep. God is not dead, nor does he sleep. For Christ is here, his spirit near, brings peace on earth, goodwill to men. When men repent and turn from sin... The Prince of Peace then enters in, and grace imparts within their hearts his peace on earth, goodwill to men. Amen. And go in peace.